praise the hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise the hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise the hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. Praise the hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. Oh, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Deep 
sons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only Thou art holy, there is none beside Thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Sing hallelujah. today where we are through that sadness and joy, Lord. I pray that you open our hearts this morning. In the name we pray, amen. Let's say our um, centering prayer together this morning. Father, overwhelm us with your love so that we live from the beauty of being your children. Jesus, deepen our love for you and teach us to love each other and all people the same way you love us. Spirit, 
Equip us and shape us as a sent people who part with you. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at the New Garden Campus today. We're in the midst of back to school time. A bunch of people went back to school two weeks ago. A bunch of people went back to school this week. Uh, a few of us were here on Monday night to welcome the DuPont Tyler students and parents to open house. So that was a really great thing that Alex and Mr. Paul and Grayson and Caroline were able to do this week. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, if this is your first time with us, we're really glad that you're here. You can fill out a connection card out at the table at the front um, by the door. And when you do that, a few things are going to happen. We'll get you signed up for our weekly newsletter so that you'll be able to find out what's happening in our church, uh, different things that are going on in our community. And we are going to donate $10 uh, to a charity that you can select on the car just because you were here today and gave us an email address. Uh, no strings attached. We want the fact that you are here with us today uh, to be good for somebody else. And so we uh, want, would love for you to fill out a card. They're out by the table at the front. Um, We've got a mobile food pantry coming up in two weeks. That's on Saturday, August 24th. Uh, so we're excited about that. Come out. Uh, at our last mobile food pantry, we were able to give food out to more people than, than I've ever counted in my whole life. Uh, more people than we've ever had here at a mobile food pantry before. And so there is a great need uh, for these events in our community. And that's just one way that we like to say, you know, we're, we're here to support. We're here to help in any way that we can. No strings attached. Uh, so come on out Saturday, August 24th. We'll unload a truckload of food from Second Harvest Food Pantry um, and get it out to people who might need it. Uh, and then the next Saturday, mark your calendars for this too, is the annual church retreat. Uh, so both here, uh, our campus, and uh, people from the Woodmont campus, we're going to be heading out to Cedars of Lebanon State Park to hang out for the day, uh, sing songs together, uh, read scripture together, pray together, and have fun together, uh, play kickball, do all those types of things that you might do on a retreat. So that's from 8.30 to 4 o'clock on Saturday, August 31st. Coming out at 8.30, we'll have donuts and coffee and then we'll have lunch together. Uh, there's a Sign Up Genius uh, here that you can use to sign up and let people know you're coming. And if you want to bring something for lunch, um, that might be uh, a side dish or uh, tomatoes and lettuce for uh, the burgers that will be grilled. So uh, that's going to be a really exciting day, and I want you to know about it, and I want you to come. That's three weeks from yesterday. It is Labor Day weekend, so I understand there's a lot of things going on, but if you uh, come and spend that day with us, I don't think you're going to regret it. Um, there's a lot happening here among us, and uh, one way that you can help support that, that you can um, give it back to the things that you've been blessed with in life, if you want to give to uh, our church, you can do that in a few different ways. Um, you can do a cash or check. You can give online. That's what we do uh, at our house. It's really easy. Uh, we set our, our giving up so that it just comes out about the same time as our paycheck. It's like we never even had that money to, to begin with. So um, you can set that up. It's really easy if that's something that you want to do and in a way that you want to participate in our church life here at the New Garden Campus. So there's a few ways that you can do that. Um, I'm really thankful that you're here with us this morning. Uh, Allie is going to continue to lead us in worship. Uh, kids and Sprouts, y'all are going to have a great time in Kids Praise today. You're going to head out that door right there during our next song. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a great Sunday. So thank you for being here. I'll pray for us and we'll continue in worship. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the ways that you bless us every day uh, and every week, that the blessing that it is to be here, uh, praising you together, hearing the message from Scripture. God, thank you for all the ways that you are at work in our community, ways that we know of and have participated in, and ways that we don't yet know of 
and haven't yet participated in. God, help us to be more and more aware of the work that you're doing around us and help us to join in with that. God, help us to hear a message from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing all my life. And all my Oh 
Jesus, the only one who really sees us, the only one who can take our mess and make it beautiful. There were moments when my heart grew bitter When I had trouble letting down my guard Too afraid of being disappointed So many scars Then you came and shattered my defenses Breaking every single wall I built Never knew a perfect love could find me And be so real Jesus, the only one can free us, the only one who can take our broken things and make them whole. Jesus, the only one who really sees us, the only one who can take our mess and make it beautiful. Take our mess and make it beautiful. Oh, Jesus Oh, Christ be magnified Let His praise arise Christ be magnified
One of the uh, benefits that comes to me because my kids go back to school is I get to do a lot more reading than I do through the, month, through the summer. Uh, sometimes I, I kid with my wife and other people, sometimes it feels like I'm a cruise director during the summer because I have to uh, keep my boys entertained and in line, and it's both difficult and arduous at times. I love them, though. But when they go back to school, I get to read again, and I get to spend time listening to things and doing things. And uh, this past week, I was able to get back into some podcasts that I've kind of missed over the, over the summer and, and learn some things. And, and so I was listening to one. This, this statement came to my mind. Y'all familiar with this? I'd rather be hated for who I am than love for who I am not. Anybody know who, that, who said that? No, no Kurt Cobain fans. Kurt Cobain said that. Uh, been a, been a couple of years since Kurt Cobain said that. I actually had to laugh. I looked it up. I've heard it a lot. I looked it up when I saw Kurt Cobain said it. I had to laugh a little bit. But uh, I was listening to this podcast by one of my former uh, seminary professors, Dr. Camp, Dr. Lee Camp. Uh, if you're looking for something to listen to, No Small Endeavor, I highly recommend it. He was interviewing uh, one of his former professors by the name of Stanley Hauerwas, who is a, a giant in the faith. He has a lot of good things to say. And he, he's nearing, he just retired from uh, teaching, and he's kind of nearing the end of his... Uh, life, end of his, his life, and, and he knows that, and so he's really kind of just telling it like it is, which is something he's known for anyway, but this in this juncture is something he's really kind of plain about it. And at, near the end of the podcast, he said, he said, Lee, there's some people who don't like me. And he said, that's okay. He said, it's okay. Not everybody has to like me. Not everybody has to get along with me. He says, but, and then he dropped a, a cuss word. He said, but, do the work. Read what I've written. Listen to what I've said. And if you're going to not like me, dislike me for the right reasons. And ironically, I, I'd actually interacted with Howard Wass through several classes with Dr. Camp, and I had a pretty clear picture of who I thought he was and, and who, how I thought he was. But then I listened to his podcast, and he's really a lot different than what I imagined him being, mainly because of my own misconceptions about him. One of the things that we're trying to do as we go through this lesson about politics and being faithful in the midst of a political season that is as difficult as this one is, is we're trying to think about how do we react and how do we interact with those people that we disagree with? How do we have civil conversations with people that we really, really don't like? Because all too often, my opinion of you is based on snap judgments. By the way you vote, the shirts you wear... Sound bites, gossip, lies, whatever you want to call it. We, we seem to almost have this very, not almost, we seem to have very little use for truth. The truth of who somebody is and how somebody lives and who they are because our mind has already been made up. And that's true not just in politics, that's true in life in general. That much of what we do and how we interact is about perception, how I perceive who you are, how I perceive how you would vote, how I perceive how you treat people, how I perceive how you act, and that determines how I interact with you. Social media, for sure, is, is, is almost 100%, 100% based on just perception. What you see of people on social media is highly curated and highly edited, and only about, I would estimate, about 10% truth. Because we can determine what you see about us. I'm not on social media intentionally, but people on there, can, we can determine who you see us and how you see us and what you see of us. And the reality is, is that probably some in here, since my lesson last week we talked about politics, have already tuned me out and probably aren't listening this morning because you don't agree with what I say or what I said because of my unlikely stance on politics, if you will. And I say unlikely because given my race and my gender, and my chosen profession in life, and my beliefs, and my location, I should be proclaiming one thing. Whether I proclaim for this pulpit, I, you, if you met me out there, you'd probably expect to hear that I vote for one certain individual, and I vote one certain way, and that's the only way that I approach it. But I do not, and I am not, and I will not. And my prayer as we go through this, my hope, my prayer, that not just in the political realm as we talk about politics, but in every aspect of life, in every place in life, they were open to learning about each other. They were open to being stretched and being pushed and being sometimes pulled beyond what we want to where God needs us to be. 
There's that song, and the, the title is missing me right now, but there's this line in one song that we sing. It says, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Like, take me to places that I don't even know I need to go, God, so that I can love and be loved and do what you've called me to be. And, and I don't want you to think, and I hope that you don't ever get this from me, that I'm standing up here and I'm preaching at you and I'm trying to tell you how to live your life. I, I'm telling you, this is an us, we, me problem. I'm in no way setting myself up on a pedestal and saying that I, could be a, I should be able to tell you how to act because I include myself in this political discussion. Guess what? This guy has a lot of strong political opinions. And you know who, you know who knows them? Generally just my wife and God. Right? And I can start in my head when I meet you and I start talking to you and I start hearing who you are and what you're saying. I can start what we talked about last year, that great sort. I can start sorting pretty quickly. And I can push people into certain piles and certain places. And guess what? Once I've pushed you into a certain pile, you know how hard it is to get out of that pile? Ah, it's really hard. It's really hard. Because we are conditioned to believe that if somebody disagrees with us, if somebody disagrees with us, even if it's just a perception, right, and in no way grounded in truth, that we, we believe that something is what? Something is wrong with them. I don't mean you, Dennis, but something is wrong with them. And I'm right. right that's what we're, we're driven to. That's where we're pushed to in this kind of this climate that we're in right now, where, where if somebody disagrees with us, they are them and they are the enemy. And I need to make sure that I don't associate with them so that I don't get that stink on me. I don't get that on me, that whatever they believe. And we come back to this word that I think we need to hold on pretty close this morning to perception. Because perception plays a big role in our political sphere today. Perception plays a big role in our world today. And I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'm going to say just a little, little bit about it. This past summer, the Christian Chronicle was here and they did an article on what we're doing as a congregation. And it was published this week. It was published online and it was published on Facebook. And if you know Facebook, Facebook was not kind. There were some people on Facebook that were kind and encouraging. Facebook as a whole was not kind to us. And you know what, they do? You know what those people that weren't kind to us, you know what they know about us? What was written in about 500 words on a piece of paper. They don't know anything else about us. They don't know who we are, what we do. They don't know the lives that we've led together and the things that we do together and the life that we lead together. And their perception is that we're wrong because of who we led on stage. Their perception is that we're wrong because of what we do in worship. Their perception is that we're wrong because we don't look like them. And it's not just that we're wrong and, and you go do your thing and we do our thing. It's that you're wrong and you're really wrong. You see, I had a friend tell me the other day, he said, you know what, politics is a game. And we don't like to hear that, do we? Because politics is a game, but it's a game that has very real consequences to us. It has consequences to our everyday life. But it is a game to those people who are in it. And one of the ways that they seek to control us. And I hate to use the word they, right? I don't like to be ambiguous like that. I hate using they's and them and all that. I want to be more concrete. But the way, the, because it's just too, too ambiguous. They, and when I say they, those people who, who desire to control and, and manipulate and do bad things with their power. One of the ways they control us and in this game is through perception. Because again, public personas are very curated. Public personas are very intentional about what they put out there to see. And guess what? If there's a new a new candidate that comes up and you don't like that candidate, guess what? You're not the target audience because that candidate's been curated for somebody else and you're not it. Let me give you a couple examples, again, told to me by a good friend who's been in politics. He said that not too long ago there was this uh, race in a county, a small county between a sheriff and a deputy sheriff. And when a deputy sheriff runs against a sheriff, guess what happens? They rarely win. Deputy sheriffs rarely beat out the sheriffs. So there was this railroad running through town, railroad track running through town. So what he did is he got a bunch of teenagers together and he got some ketchup and he got a TV crew. He went out and he covered the, the teenagers in ketchup and had them laid around the railroad tracks. And then he put this commercial together and what he said was, if you vote for me, this will never happen. Guess what? It had never happened in that town. 
It had never happened in that town. And guess what? Because he created that perception that it might happen, that if you put him in office, he would make sure it didn't happen. Guess what he got? He got elected. Another town, there was a factory that closed down, a a major employer in the city. And the dog candidate, if you remember from last year, we had the giraffe and the dogs, right? And the dog candidate came and got a news crew and came and stood outside the, the door and said, the giraffes are responsible for this. This is closed and nobody has a job because of the giraffes, the way the giraffes are running this town. When the, the truth was that the plant was not run well, it was mismanaged and they went out of business. But guess what that dog was able to do? He was able to run that false ad all the way into office. You see, perception and reality are two different things. And so if we're going to be faithful to God in the midst of an election year, we need to, to at the very least, understand and accept that we are being manipulated. And that's a hard one, right? That's a hard one. And it means that we need to use what God has given us to make clear decisions and good decisions, decisions that impact in a positive way the world that we live in. And so we come to our text for today, which... I don't know how it happened, but I got one verse today. Last week, last week I had like 20. This week I got one verse. And this comes from Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And he says, and he's quoting Isaiah, he says, Who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so at some point we have to come to terms with the reality that we, those in the political realm, are playing a game that we're subject to. And they're trying to manipulate us and to get us to vote for candidates in such a way by using our faith and using our fear against us. And so at some point, we've got to pivot away from that. We've got to step away from what is being told us. And I would recommend everybody in here, if you would do it right now, I'd love it, if you would just delete your social media because you're being fed a lot of garbage on social media. Stop watching so much news. Stop being so involved in that. Be about kingdom stuff. And if you've got to be in the midst of that, balance it against the good stuff coming into your life. Read your Bible twice as much as you read anything else in the world. Let me say that again. Read your Bible twice as much as you read anything else in the world. Every time you spend 10 minutes reading something on on CNN or on Fox News or on Instagram or on Facebook or wherever it is, spend 20 minutes reading your Bible to backfill against that and push that out of your mind. And I'm not saying, and this is hard because this is what I want to do, I'm not saying we disengage from the process because that's one thing that I want to do. I sit back and I watch and I look and I see and I see how ugly it is and how just the meanness of it all and just how, ah. And I just want to step back and say, no, I don't want any of that. But if we step out of that and we step away from that, you know what happens? A vacuum is created. And you know what happens when a vacuum is created? Something else is pulled into it. And more voices of of ill will and more voices of meanness and more voices of bad things will come into it. And so we have to vote and we have to engage in the political process in such a way that our witness to God is faithful. We have to vote and be present in the political realm so that they, when they look at us, they know that we're not voting Republican, and they know we're not voting Democrat, but that we're voting like children of the King. That we're voting like children of God. So that that is the witness. Because disengagement is difficult and not what I would say we need at all. But instead, we, we engage those fruits of the Spirit we talked about again last week from Paul in Galatians where he says... We know what the bad things are, right? Anger, jealousy, fits of rage. But the fruits of the Spirit, the one that we say we walk with, the place that we say we are is love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And when those those traits are lived out in our conversations, when those traits are lived out in bold ways in the way we walk around in the world, then we can change the tenor of the conversation. We don't have to be doomed to accept the way our, li- our, our world is working right now. We are called to be agents of salt and light, to be agents of good things in this world. And I believe we're called to be that so that we can do good things and be good people and be what God has called and loudly proclaim that the kingdom of God is the reality in which we live and the kingdom of God is where we firmly place ourselves. So we talked a bit about that 
young church in Corinth last week. You, you want to read about it, you read back in Acts 18 where Paul on one of his journeys went to, went to Corinth. He spent some time there and Corinth was a hopping place. Like it was a major trade route. There was so many people, lots of money, lots of politics, lots of power. A lot was going on. And he got in there and, and started a church and he moves on. He gets word that there's bad things happening. And the first thing that comes to his ears is the church is starting to fracture Church is starting to split up and become different places and different people saying, oh, I, I'm going to be with the Paul group, and I'm going to be with the Apollos group, and I'm going to be with the Peter group, and I, I think there's a Jesus group back there in the back. And Paul asked the question, he says, is Christ divided? Of all the things we do, we start dividing up the church? And the question that I hear Paul continually asking throughout the book of 1 Corinthians as he talks through about four or five major things that they're struggling with as a young church is, are we living out what we believe? Are we living out for the world to see what we say we believe? Not what we just say, but what we actually believe because we can tell how somebody is and who somebody is by watching what they believe so much more more so than watching or hearing what they say. Because talk is easy. And maybe we need to admit, and just be honest with ourselves, because many of us want to be honest with ourselves, that we are living out what we believe, and it's just not that Jesus is Lord. And so Paul tells them the church is not a popularity contest. It is a collection of people, a community of people that is centered around Jesus. That if you see a group of believers in the middle is Jesus and they are, they are in movement around Him, following Him, being led by Him, being taken by Him. And it can't be both. We can't be centered around Jesus and centered around America both. It's not a both and. It is either we are centered around Jesus and He is our Messiah and He is our Master or we're centered around America and that is our church and that is our God. And it doesn't make us bad people to actually live out what we believe. To take what we say in here and put it to work out there. I fully believe that America can and will be a better place if those that say they believe in God will be faithful to the kingdom of God. Will be faithful in all aspects to the kingdom of God, first and only. And we live out God's values here and now in this place and in this time. Howard Wass, the, the guy from the podcast I talked about earlier, his dad was a brick mason. And he, he grew up in a period of time where you learned your father's trade and you followed in your family, and that's what you did. And so he learned to be a brick mason. He said, I hated it and I had no intention of doing it, but I had to go learn how to be a brick mason. And guess what you do when you go into a trade like that? You are apprenticed to a master. There's somebody out there that knows what they're doing and has done it a long time, is very good at it, and you are apprenticed to that person and you learn how to do that from that person. And he said even though he hated it, he didn't see any merit in it, he did find a lot of merit in the process and about how it came down to following Jesus. Because when you apprentice yourself to somebody, you learn the language of that trade. He learned how to lay block and he learned how to to shoot a string and and make sure a wall was straight. He learned how to to, to listen. And guess what he learned? He learned how to take correction. All by being an apprentice. He learned how to be led. And you see, the only way that we can become a real, true disciple of Christ is to to apprentice ourselves to the Master. Harawas talked about going and seeing his dad look at a new building that, that somebody designed and having to figure out how to lay brick and lay block around it. And it took him a while, but he had enough knowledge in him that he was able to build things that he'd never built before and do things that he'd never done before. And he watched him patiently do that. And he watched him and he learned. And you see, we shortchange the kingdom when we take our eyes off of Jesus and follow somebody else. You see, Jesus is the author of our faith. Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the finisher of our faith. And if we want to be faithful and we want to figure out where He's leading us, we have to keep our eyes on Him and follow where He is going and be led where He is leading us. And we have to be given to the idea that Jesus is just important here on Sunday morning as He is tomorrow morning when you go to work or this afternoon when you go to work or tomorrow when you go to school 
or whatever you do tomorrow, whatever you do this afternoon, that Jesus is just as important then as He is now in this moment. That the things we talk about here, the things that we proclaim here, whether through our worship or whether through our words or our communion time or whatever it is, the things that we proclaim are just as important out there as they are in here. And that we are apprenticed to Jesus in such a way that we follow Him even when, does, even when it doesn't fit neatly into what we already have going on in our life. Howard Wass had a lot of things to say about things he didn't like. And he, he said, I don't really like the, the phrasing personal relationship with Jesus. I don't think I use that term much here, and I don't think we use it much in our, our context. But he, he talks about saying how we've kind of abused the idea of having a personal relationship with, with Jesus in that we are trying to take Jesus from over there and bring Him to us instead of us going and being where He is. You see, because it's easy to take Jesus and put Him in our context and make Him look like we look like. Because when we say we have a personal relationship with Jesus, guess what Jesus tends to do? He tends to talk like we talk and He tends to walk like we talk, walk and He tends to go where we go and He tends to vote like we vote. When the reality of it is if we're going to apprentice ourselves to the Master and follow Jesus, then we need to walk like He walks and talk like He talks and vote like He would vote. I'm not even going near that one. But you understand there are certain things that override anything that we have going on in our context today, and those things are from God. And so we have to start asking the question, And don't get lost in the, the pithiness of this and how it used to be on, on bracelets, right? Because we used to have bracelets we wore around that said WWJD. And we almost abused the idea because it became something just so commonplace. See, because it matters what Jesus would do when I'm driving down the road and I've got that knucklehead who wants to merge when he should have merged a mile back, right? Right? It matters what would Jesus do when I am sitting in the midst of my work friends and all of a sudden they start gossiping and talking about people and making fun of people. It matters what Jesus would do in that context. It matters what Jesus would do when we're sitting around with our friends and our family and all of a sudden politics come up and it gets really ugly really fast because it matters in that moment what Jesus would do. And if we want to say that we are apprentices to the Master, then it matters what we do in that moment. Because we're either being faithful we're either being faithful to the apprenticeship that we've entered into or we're not being. And so I would dare say, and this is a new one, right? This is a new one I just learned, just, and it's in a song too, right? What would Jesus do? He would love first. There's a Christian song right now that's rocking this one, and I love it, right? What would Jesus do in any, in any situation? He's going to care about the person sitting across the table from him. He's going to care about the person in the car next to him. He's going to care about your coworkers sitting around the, the break room table. He's going to care about your family that you can't even stand to be around because of the, the tenor of the conversation. In every situation, Jesus is going to do what God requires of him to do. In every situation, He's going to care about the sinner and the saint alike, and we, we can define those loosely, I guess. In every situation, He's going to care about your brother and your enemy alike. It was funny because in last week's, as I was talking through last week's lesson, I actually, I actually ordered these last week, and they didn't come in in time, and so I cut that section out of my lesson, and we were talking down here on the community table, and Laura came up to me and she said, you know, one of the things I try to do is I try and think, what would Jesus do? I thought, well, maybe that's God saying, let's bring it back and let's see if it fits. I think if we couple looking to Jesus and embracing the attitude and the way that He leads us in life, the question of how we are Christian in politics becomes a whole lot clearer. It becomes the same question we have when how am I a Christian in my family? How am I a Christian in my workspace? How am I... I'm the same person everywhere. And it doesn't matter what the subject is. It doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter. Because I'm the same person everywhere. And you got to love AI, right? Last week I had the, the giraffes and the dogs, and so I typed into AI. I said, hey, AI, I need a picture of Jesus holding a baby giraffe and a baby dog. And I got it, right? 
See, it doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you sit on or how far out you are or how far in you are. God loved you before I knew you. God loved all of us before He knew us. Before we knew each other. God's going to love us even when we don't love ourselves and we don't love each other. God's going to love us even after we're gone. So let's not overcomplicate it. Which is what I said last week. Let's not overcomplicate it, right? God belongs in all places in our lives. He is the creator of everything, the author of everything. And we're not doing ourselves any justices by living in situations where all we do is be negative and be ugly and tear people down. We're not doing... And here's another thing I'd encourage you to do. If you live in an echo chamber where the only thing you hear is people just like you, get out and find some new people to hang out with. And that's hard. (laughs) That is hard. Because if all we ever hear when somebody says, what do you think about X? Not Twitter. But what do you think about... Because i got opinions on that too. What do you think about politics? And then uh, you know from just the, the amount of people gathered in the room what the conversation is going to be like. If all we ever hear is the negative and the dissenting or beating somebody up or talking bad about somebody, then you need new voices in your life. You need new people around you. You need a fresh set of ears to hear. And the same thing goes, if the only thing I ever hear are sounds of praise then I'll become stagnant. At some point, I'll take my eyes off Jesus. So let's stop trying to take Jesus and mold Him to look like us. Because He doesn't look like us. And He doesn't want to look like us. He wants us to look like Him. He wants us to follow Him. There's this... (laughs) I listen to a lot of Christian radio. There's this song out right now. And I think the title is, I was made for more. And there's this kind of recurring line in there where the guy says, I wasn't made to be tending a grave. I was bought by grace, called by name. I honestly feel that the place that we're in right now is we are tending a grave. We're tending a grave of politics. We're tending a grave of love of nation. We're tending a grave of... of, idolatry that we need to get rid of. That if we're going to be faithful to the kingdom, if we're going to say that we are are followers of God, that Jesus is our Master, our Lord, our, our, our everything, then we got to stop tending the graves that are all around us and we've got to focus on what God is calling us to. And that's what I love about this church. Of all the negative things people are saying about it right now, you know what we are? We are a church that loves this community and serves this community and endeavors in the greatest way possible to live that love out, live the love of God out in this community. And at the end of the day, I don't care what anybody has to say. I don't care what anybody outside here thinks about that. Because that's who God has called us to be and that's who we are trying to follow, not somebody on Facebook who thinks they know better. I was listening to a listen to another podcast by again from Lee Camp, and he was interviewing this guy that died a couple years ago. One of his good friends got uh, colon cancer; was pretty pretty severe when he got it in his late forties, and he died about two years later. And he did these series of interviews, and then he just published them after he kind of edited them and worked through them. And the guy talked about a lot of stuff. And it was, it was hard to listen to, right? Like there were several times during the podcast that I teared up. Like it was just hard to listen to. At one point he said, one of the things I've had to come to terms with is that we are all about one generation away from being forgotten. Like we're all going to die. And my kids' kids may know who I am. Hopefully they know who I am. But my kids' kids' kids won't. They may know who I was. And so the call, and he was talking about the call in my life is to impact those people around me. To impact those people around me in a way that I'm not going to be able to impact the next generation, the generation, and the generations after that. That I spend my time Building and loving and leading and being a disciple in such a way the people that I can impact right now are the ones that I am trying to impact. 
I think we've lost sight of who we need to be and who we are. And I think there's a way out of that. I do think there's a way out of that. I think of something as simple as asking in every situation, what would Jesus do? And understanding without any doubt that in every situation, Jesus would love before anything. I've got plenty of these braces. If you want one, I've got enough. Everybody take five of them. Come see me. I'll swim down here on the stage. I hope, they, I hope you'll put them on your keychain or maybe you'll wear them or whatever. Maybe some way you'll think about this week when you enter a conversation that's going to be difficult or when a, th- when a thought pops into your head that is negative and that you need to stop thinking that you will think about the one you're apprenticed to, not the one that's trying to lead you away. So we come to our table time. Right? Every week we come here, every week we come to sit around the table and stand around the table. And guess what? This is not my table. This is not New Garden's table. It's God's table. Because if it were ours, what would we do? Uh, we'd probably put a fence around it and try and keep some people out. Some people who don't agree with us, some people who don't like the way they look, some people who just don't jive with where we're at. We'd probably put a fence around and try and keep people out there. We're going to disagree with pretty hard, harshly over the next three months. But it's not our table. So it doesn't matter who you voted for or who you're going to vote for. You're welcome at the table. It doesn't matter where you were born. You're welcome at the table. It doesn't matter what you did last night or what you're going to do this afternoon or tomorrow. You are welcome at God's table because it's God's table and He is here and He is waiting for you. Pray with me. God, for today I am thankful. May the words spoken today be only from You and everything else forgotten. May we come to the table with earnestness and eagerness waiting to see You, be with You, commune with You and with Your your family, not just here but the world over. Thank You for Jesus. May we forever apprentice ourselves to Him and go where He is leading us. May we forever be Your people in every context. In Jesus' name, amen. Come, let's go to the table.
As we head out today, let's remember that we have the mind of Christ. We don't all agree. There's tons of diversity in this room in the ways that we think, in the things that we value and believe, but we have the most important thing in common, that Jesus Christ is our Savior. We've been filled with the Spirit to do good works in our communities. And that's a great thing. And I would be remiss if I did not mention before we leave that Eva leaves for college on Friday. So we're excited about that. So on your way out,